Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Rachel. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, with a movie like Tetris, it was really fun kind of watching how the game elements of like the, the actual movie come to life in the midst of like, I think the, the scene I'm thinking of in particular is I love the car chase scene where it turns into a video game car chase scene as yeah. we're watching it unfold. Um, and so for you as a director, getting to kind of play with those fun aspects in a video game, in a movie about a video game, what was kind of the exciting part about like having those little elements and getting to mess around with the different ways you can incorporate it? Yeah, it was kind of, that all came in post-production because, you know, the whole car chase was shot on blue screen and there was elements of it that, that were hinted to in the script, but not really. It was just, there wasn't much of it. So it was like an open book in, in mm -hmm. the, um, in the in post-production. So when we actually shot the movie, it was more like shooting a Cold War thriller. And then when we got in post, it was more, more like adding, you know, the fun element to it, yeah? Um, and we just had to, it was a trial and error of, of how much of that stuff would work with the, with the material that we'd already shot. Mm -hmm. um you know in conjunction with that so how much can a how much can a cold war thriller accommodate the the fun sort of game stuff and and i think we there was a stage where we put too much game stuff in and then it, we we seemed to lost the sort of heart of the film and then we took it out and we, there wasn't enough out there wasn't enough in there so it was a lot of fun it was a long process because you know it was back and forth with a lot of visual effects houses and and experimenting with things and different kinds of people come up with the ideas. Um, so, so yeah, it was good. It was something that I'd never done before because I've not done a lot of visual effects. So it mm -hmm. was a really good lear learning curve for me on, on this movie. And it's, it's very, uh, for being, as you said, a Cold, War th a Cold War thriller, it is also really fun at times. Like I really love how Hank had no, no qualms just fighting with Russians. Like he would be in that room and he would have what he needed to say and he would say it and be like, just give me the contract, I'll figure it out. And I really kind of yeah. liked that tension break. Um, so as as you're like filming those scenes, was that something you were conscious of? Like, obviously I know it's built into the script, but were you conscious of like that being the tension break of the movie as a whole? Because it is very like, oh no, what's going to happen? Even though we know Tetris does eventually, like we know in our heads where it goes it does still have that like, oh no, what's going to happen to him kind of feel to it. Yeah, I mean, I think we always had the idea it was going to be like a tense kind of thriller aspect. And because of, you know, it was, you know, the Cold War, which lends itself to that. Uh, and about this fish out of water who was throwing himself in, probably through naivety and stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and the jeopardy that that sort of uh, creates. But it was weird. It wasn't until we watched the film with an audience in uh, South by Southwest that we realised that how much levity and how much humour we, we were getting in different places and there's some things that the audience were laughing at that, that I never ever found that I well, never thought was going to be funny so mm -hmm. it was interesting to see that as well and to see where those moments came um, but yeah but again you you watch the film with a different audience and, and they don't like we watched it we, we had a premiere in Scotland as well and, and the British audiences are far less kind of vociferous than the than the American ones, you know, we're mm -hmm. far more uptight about it and, and a bit more embarrassed about showing our emotions, you know, so they kind of laugh inwardly. So it's interesting to see where art breaks, but, but yeah, it, it's, um, I like making films where you can make laugh, make people scared and you can make them laugh or you can maybe make them cry or feel a load of different emotions as well. It's, it's, it's the big challenge of filmmaking. Yeah, and I think uh, you mentioned Scotland. I remember the last time we talked, you were one of the first people ever in an interview to remember that or to know that my last name was Scottish. Because I was like, yeah, oh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm Scottish. I up again just now. I was like, yeah, at least I remember, remember the conversation we had. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, no one realizes it's Scottish. And then I was like, oh, wait, yeah. so someone does. That's nuts. Yeah. Um, no problem. But what I love about this movie in particular is I'm a big Taron Edergen fan. Um, I still think he should have had an Oscar. For Rocket Man, and it's a tragedy that he did not. But I do love like the scenes, especially when he's with Alexi and they're kind of having fun with each other, despite Alexi being like, We can't be doing this, we're in Russia. Um, I love kind of seeing the, that side of Hank and like how he does want to have like 
the reason he likes this game isn't because he thinks it's going to make a lot of money, even though he knows it will. It's because he's like, I can't stop thinking about it. Like, I just like games. So when you're marrying with that fun energy that we get to see in like the club scene when he's singing the final countdown with like kind of the the weight of the situation, how much do you work with Taryn to kind of build that, those levels of like the fun moments mixed with like, he's aware of what he's trying to do and how he's trying to connect to all these people in Russia. Yeah, I think it's just conversations that you have in pre-production, you know, about the script and then you get in rehearsals and you you just talk about it on the day as well. And you, you've you got to be, as a director, you've got to be the guy who keeps an eye on the, the whole sort of piece and, and that it's, it's becoming the same film, you know, because there's a danger in a movie like this that you're making three different films and they don't fit together. So mm-hmm. I think it's always about, how, you know, tr- making them trust you that, that 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 your sort of direction is is the right one for there's a couple of scenes where Taron got pretty nervous about um and and they 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 resulted in big discussions uh but then we sort of always managed to get there at the end uh where I think he was maybe thought he was going too far whether it be one way or the other but that's your job as a director to sort of like mm-hmm. <clears throat> coach them into a way where you know, you're, you you get them to trust you in a way that you've got the overall um, sort of balance of what the film is going to be, you know, and that's just about, and you just learn that through the through the process. Sometimes when you first start out as a director and, a, and, a, and an actor challenges you like that, you get really nervous and you get tongue-tied and you can't do it. And, and, and it, it's not, it doesn't really help at all, but it's just through experience, you sort of get to know how you talk to actors and, and get them to trust you so that your vision is the one it's carried through, you know? And I think uh, you kind of have mastered because you did Stonehouse, which I really, really liked. And this too, uh, which are two stories that are like, not that well known, like the origin of it. Like we know Tetris, but a lot yeah. of people might not know, like it was a, a fight during the cold war to get Tetris for gaming consoles. But you kind of have this way of like directing these historic things that could feel very like stagnant uh, because they are real events and you can easily just Google if you have questions. Like it's not like a movie that's going to continually keep you on the edge, but you have a way of making it so that you don't want to know what's going on outside of the movie you're watching. You kind of just are like, I'm invested in this story. I want to see how it unfolds. Is there a a way that you approach those scripts as a director to make it so that like they feel like you're watching some story that we can never look up on our own or is it just kind of the way that you have picked these specific projects that comes across yeah. that way I, I've always loved movies about true stories so I've always mm-hmm. been drawn to them anyway so it's maybe an instinctual thing um, on a conscious level I think you need to take a responsibility for your subject matter um and even though that that person or those people are shown in a bad light or an embarrassing light you've kind of got to be trying you've got to try and be true to the characters especially who's on the page but the people who are sort of um you know if if they're not alive then they're existing relatives or whatever but you kind of have to take a responsibility to the truth and i think when you do it and you invest in that then it's over to your actors, you know, it's over to your actors to, you know, when you guide them uh, to to engage the audience, really, in terms of, you know, you can have the biggest camera tricks and you can have the best music and stuff like that. But if you don't cast the movie right, Spielberg always kind of says, cast your movie right and you're 80% there as a director, you know. So I think that that's why I put a hell of a lot of time into the casting process and then, in rehearsals as well and then by the time you get to film and it is it's 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 kind of like a theater performance because it's so well sort of rehearsed and uh, you're just fine-tuning those details but it, it must maybe come from an instinctual place um i don't know it's a good question i have to say it's none of it's not one that i've thought about before but yeah it's a good question Thanks. Um, for a fun kind of last question, I do have to ask. The music in this movie is very fun, uh, which it lends itself to that because it's the 80s. But um, like listening to the final countdown and holding out for a hero in a movie that is, like you said, essentially a cult war movie was kind of like 
otherworldly when I stopped and thought about it for too long. But what was a yeah. song that like you really wanted to use that you didn't get the rights to, or did you get all of the rights to the songs you wanted to use uh, from the jump? I think the original song we had at the end of the director's cut was uh, um, was by Starship, yeah, uh, which they used in Mannequin, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember. And is it Nothing's Going to Stop Us Now? Is that the name of the? Is that, is that the name? Of the thing? I think so. I think that's yeah. the full name. That's of it. What, anyway, it was it was it was by Starship when they used it in Mannequin, and we used that at the beginning, and then we used. Together on Electric Dreams by Phil Loki and Georgie Moroda. Um, and that was a film that I, that's a song that I had used at my, at my the first dance at my, at my wedding, and it just kind of seemed to fit. But for some reason, and I can't remember because it's so long now since we did the director's cut, that we couldn't get the rights, or we or we decided that the, the pitch up voice was the right one. So there was another couple of 80s ones, but mm -hmm. we always had the final countdown on air because it was the it was the final song that was played in East German radio before the El before the Berlin Wall fell. So it was a very sort of like historic reference to that. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. I loved I loved it. I thought it was like that scene in particular. I'm like, mm, I'm going to be thinking about that scene for a while because I think it's just so much fun in a movie where you're like, the stakes are way too high for this guy singing yeah. the final it countdown of the bit, club. It feels a bit strange, but hopefully it, it worked, you know? It, it does. You're like, I understand everything he's doing and why he's doing it, but man, he was like, I don't care that I'm in Russia. I'm getting what I came here for, and I'm, a, yeah. I'm just going to go for there it. Go. Um, thank you so much for talking with me. I really like the movie, and I'm so glad it's out now and people get to see Tetris. I appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. Of course. Have a great one. Bye. See you.